Well, yeah, so today is uh, January 7th. Uh, welcome back and all that. The few, the proud. The, uh, um, it was on this date in uh, 1536 that Catherine of Aragon died. Uh, Catherine of Aragon, who was uh, Henry VIII's first wife, and the mother of Mary, who becomes queen after the death of, uh, well, no, Edward becomes king after the death of Henry. Edward is the king for a few years. Then he dies. Then there's Jane Grey for nine days. And then there's Mary, uh, a.k.a. Bloody Mary. She's the one that started the great persecution, resulting in a lot of Protestant trying to bring the country back to Catholicism. Uh, and so you had a large number of English Protestants going over to that uh, the, that 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 Rome of the Catholic or that Protestant Rome, aka or the, not the Protestant Rome, Geneva, Switzerland, where John Calvin was, and they were called the Marian Exiles, and they kind of fermented there for a while until Mary dies, and her sister Elizabeth becomes the queen, and then they all come back and. That's it. So, um, but she died on this day. She was 50 years old. Um, she, she, she died of natural causes. She was not killed. She, she was uh, um, among, un, unlike several of Henry VIII's other wives, she was not killed. She did die of natural causes. Uh, in 1610, Galileo discovered the first three moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, and Ganymede. Galileo uh, of course, we all know, is famous for a number of things, not the least of which is he and I were born on the same day. So just not necessarily the same year. I'm not that old, but uh, although maybe may remarkably well-preserved. Um, also born on this date, another great American, Millard Fillmore, born on this date. Millard Fillmore, the 13th president of the United States, um, often referred to as the worst president of the United States. Um, not exactly forgotten because there is, in fact, a Millard Fillmore Society out there that uh, um, celebrates his time. He was the president from 1850 to 1853, and he was still active. So that would have been right around the time of the Compromise of 1850. Kind of missed a lot of the whole um, uh, uh, build up to the Civil War. And so that there are th it's, it's often believed that there are things that he could have done during his presidency that would have uh, uh, done away with or, or uh, removed the possibility of a civil war. But he was born on this date in 1800. In 1822, Liberia was colonized by the American Colonization Society. This was a, uh, the, Liberia is, is, and this was the idea that one way to deal with the African population in the United States was to take them back to Africa. And so they went to Liberia. They, they settled the country of Liberia, found a capital, and named their capital after the president of the United States, Monrovia, uh, after James Monroe, and it is still called Monrovia. Uh, Liberia is over on the western side of, uh, you know, if, if, if Africa, you know, if Africa kind of looks like this, Liberia is like right about there, kind of near Ghana and all of that, or maybe it's closer over here. But regardless that won't be on your test just so you know but uh, that was uh, didn't really do it wasn't as successful um, for a number of reasons not the least of which is by that time you had Africans uh, who had been in this country for several generations so it was like it was not like you know they had just been pulled last week from Africa and they're sending them back it's like okay well your ancestors lived here a hundred years ago it's go back so uh, was not as successful as some thought it was going to. Uh, in 1927, the Harlem Globetrotters played their first game in Hinckley, Illinois. There, you know, Hinckley, Illinois. I believe they were founded by a guy named Abe Saperstein. Although it is sort of a foregone conclusion, what's what's going to happen in the game? It's it's almost like a it's, it's almost like you're watching a play. You know, this is there's some clearly choreographed uh, things going on. Um, but for a long period of time, the Highland Globetrotters were like the only game in town if you were an African-American basketball player. So uh, even somebody like Wilt Chamberlain played for the Highland Globetrotters because that was it. That's all you had. So um, 
but yeah, that was uh, that was on this date in 1927. Uh, some of you may remember this. Some of you. Uh, it was on this date in 1980 that Jimmy Carter authorized the bailout of Chrysler Motors. Um, I don't know if you remember that. It was uh, one of those things that uh, too big to fail is where that concept first started becoming popular. Um, but it was uh, that was uh, on this date in 1980. Uh, in 1998, uh, Monica Lewinsky signed an affidavit denying having an affair with Bill Clinton. And on this date in 1999, Clinton's impeachment trial for lying about the affair he was having with Monica Lewinsky started. So one year to the date that she signed an affidavit saying it didn't happen, he goes on trial lying about it. So, um, and then of course now it's uh, impeachment trials are going to become a regular, a regular thing. Um, finally, today is Alan Napier's birthday. Remember who Alan Napier is? Anyone? He was the uh, butler. Alfred in the Batman TV series. He was it's his birthday today, and it's also Charles Adams' birthday. Cartoonist Charles Adams, A D D A M S. No one. Da 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 da. Oh. Yeah, Charles Adams, the Adams family. He had a uh, he had a series of cartoons, and uh, featuring the Adams family and somebody said that they were going to uh, made a, made a TV show out of it. So, um, all right. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 11. All right. <coughs> so, 1 Corinthians. Letter from the Apostle Paul to the uh, church at Corinth. And... So we've been gone for a while, uh, and again, we, we remember kind of a quick review that Paul had uh, spent some time in Corinth. He had um, ministered there for uh, 18, mo 18 months, two years, 18 months, I think. Um, and it, after leaving Corinth, um, there had a succession of, you know, Apollos came in, and then others may have come in, um, and there was a... Uh, communication going back and forth between Paul and the church at Corinth. And we know um, it's pretty clear that what we call 1 Corinthians is not Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, because he refers to a letter uh, somewhere, somewhere else. Um, and then uh, they had written to him, and he had talked to people, and, you know, as you can imagine, <coughs> whenever you meet up with somebody who's from a church that you used to go to, um, and this, like this happened with, with Debbie and I over Christmas. We met up with people that we used to go to church with several years ago. And we're like, oh, what happened to this person? What happened to that person? And kind of, so Paul was uh, talking about um, hearing from the, about the church. And so 1 Corinthians, what we call 1 Corinthians, comes into two main parts. The first part of it is what Paul has heard. And the second thing is in response to... Um, letter the letter that they sent okay now it's not absolute because here like today we're going to talk about or, or over the next three weeks we're going to talk about different things that he, he mentions he heard these things so you know it, it's kind of like they they wrote about this and then he said oh yeah well i also heard that so it's not a hundred percent but generally speaking the first half are things he heard second half are things that they wrote about so uh, today um, we're going we're gonna to start into a section, uh, passage 11, 12, and 11 and 12, where he deals with three ongoing problems in the church. First of all, in verse 1, I'm sorry, verse 3, we're going to start with verse 2. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. So Paul praises the church for remembering and for holding to the traditions that he has passed along to them, okay? Um, which is kind of interesting because now he's going to go into uh, several areas on where they haven't quite held on to some of the traditions the way they should have. So, you know, basically he's saying, hey, I love the way you guys have held on to the, tr the traditions, but you could do a little better here, all right, in, in three particular areas. First particular areas I'm going to talk about are head coverings, 
head coverings in church, problems with the Lord's Supper, and today, and, and finally he's going to talk about problems with spiritual gifts. And those are the three sections. Today we're only going to talk about the head coverings. Um, and I've been uh, just obsessed with, with head coverings for, for the last week. Just been talking about them and... Debbie's finally glad because they keep putting hats on her, and she's like, no, just stop that. Just stop that. Like, Come on, woman, obey. But uh, she doesn't. Um, so what seems, we need, what seems to be going on in Corinth? Okay, now here's the problem. We do not know exactly the full extent of the issue in Corinth. And this is true of pretty much all of 1 Corinthians. But we do not know exactly what the problem was or the full significance of it. Okay, it seems, <coughs> excuse me, it seems that women are praying and, and or prophesying, so you could put prophesying first if you want, because you both start with P. Women are praying and or prophesying with an uncovered head. Okay, so he says in verse 3, But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. So again, what's going on in Corinth? Okay, this is the million dollar question. Women seem to be praying and are prophesying with an uncovered head. Now, the very simple summary, that's what VSS stands for, the very simple summary of this passage is that Paul says, stop that. Just don't do that anymore. Come on in, Norman. It's all right. So the very simple summary is Paul says, stop that, which, of course, always reminds me of that great Mad, it was Mad TV. Have I mentioned this one before, where Bob Newhart uh, stars? A, there's a skit where Bob Newhart is, is, is a therapist, and he's, he's going to solve everybody's problem for five, three words for five bucks. Have you seen this one? Have you ever seen this? Yeah, just, just Google it. Bob Newhart, just stop that. And basically, the woman comes in because she has some anxiety. And he's like, okay, you got $5 cash, pay me $5, and I'm going to tell you what to do. And so the woman <coughs> explains her issue, and I think it has something to do with claustrophobia, fear, fear of being buried in a box. And he says, all right. Are you? She says, she's like, should I take notes? He goes, okay, go ahead. It's just three words. And finally, are you ready? Yeah, okay, just stop that. That's it. She's like, what? Is that? Yeah, just stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. So that kind of, that's the very simple summary. Just stop it. Quit this whole uncovering, praying, or prophesying with the head uncovered. Okay. Now the question there is, <coughs> I was trying to, to be clever with my, with my in cutting and pasting there. You know, but why? Why? What, what's going, well, since you asked, we'll go into there. First of all, Paul establishes three relationships here in the first in that first passage verse one or verse three i'm sorry but i want you to realize that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of christ is god okay so the head of every man is christ the head of every woman is man and the head of christ is god okay now the words translated here man and woman are normally translated husband and wife Okay, so some have argued that this, this is a mistranslation. Okay, that it should be, he's talking about husbands and wives in church and not just men and women. Okay, um, I, I don't, 
I'm agnostic about that, or I, I'm indifferent as far as what the difference makes, but we'll see. Um, but that's one of the things that's confusing about it, what makes this particular passage confusing. Um, now, the word translated head there, it's a Greek word kephale, or kephale, K-E-P-H-A-L-E, can be translated one of three ways. Okay, The first way, when you use the Greek word kephale, it means your head, this, that thing above your shoulders. Okay, so That is the most common use of the word. Okay. It could also mean authority, like so-and-so is the head of the company. Okay, In Ephesians 1.22, Paul seems to use that, referring to Christ, as being the authority, the head of the church. Okay, um, And it could also mean source. And in verse 4, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul uses that to, to as generally believed to mean source. Now, it's used, like, it, it's like, if, if it's used a, a hundred times, and these are just, I'm just making it up just so you get a point, um, 80 times it's used to mean head, like head. You know, they cut their head off. 80 out of a hundred times it's used for that. Then it's like 12 times it's used for um, authority, eight times it's used for source. Just, okay, but it could be used properly for any one of those three things. All right, so the word head there could mean think above your shoulders, authority, or source. Okay, now the word covered or uncovered phrases, and this is going back to 1114, could refer to like the wearing of a hat, a head covering, a physical cap of some sort, or it could refer to hair length, because in 1114, he comes back and he starts talking about hair length. Okay. Now, the, the word here, when it's talking about covering, it usually means a covering, an actual hat. But then later in the text, he says, your hair covering is your covering. Okay? So, now I've gotten to the last, the next question on the thing. Are you thoroughly confused yet? Okay? <clears throat> so, basically, you look at verse 5a. It's a woman wife who prophesies praise with her head uncovered or short, hair short, Dishonors her head, source, and authority. Got that? All right, we're done. See you guys next week. We'll talk about, there you go, clear as mud. Note, side note here, and this is just an interesting thing to kind of note, because it'll come back later. Paul makes no comment about the fact that the woman is prophesying or praying in public. He doesn't seem to have a problem with that here. Now, how do I know they're doing it in public? Well, how does Paul know that they don't have a hair, head covering? If I told you that every day I have a prayer closet and I go into my prayer closet dressed as Captain America, how would you know whether I'm telling the truth or not? You wouldn't. Because, again, that's kind of the definition of a prayer closet. You're in there by yourself, close the door, it's dark. And I tell you I dress as Captain America to do that. You would know. Right? So if this is something they're doing in private, Paul would know. It wouldn't be a church-wide thing. Okay? But the fact that they're doing it in public is what's causing the dissension. Okay? So something about this, okay? So something about the fact that women are in church in Corinth are praying or prophesying with their head uncovered is causing some sort of grief. At least grief to Paul. Okay? So, what, what is that? What is going on? Well, Paul, <coughs> the, the summary is that in verses 5b through 8, women should not pray or prophesy uncovered, and men shouldn't pray covered, in terms of head coverings. Okay? It is argued here, so one of the ways to look at it is it is argued that, that women uh, with short hair uncovered, and this is one way to look at this, so what, what's the problem here? What, what's the problem? Let me try and think about it in this, this phrase. What, what's the problem with their being uncovered? Well, um, part of it is what does that signify that a woman in Corinth was there with an uncovered head? Okay. 
Well, there's only one other section in the Bible, and I'm kind of going off the thing now. There's only one other passage in the Bible, and it's in Deuteronomy 21, where it talks about a woman's hair length. Okay? And, and it says in, in Deuteronomy 21, and I'll just read the passage to you. In Deuteronomy 21, beginning with verse 10, this is Moses is writing, giving the instruction to the children of Israel. It says, When you go to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you take captives, if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. Bring her into your home and have her shave her head, trim her nails, and put aside the clothes she was wearing when captured. After she has lived in her house and mourned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. If you are not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave, since you have dishonored her. Okay. Now that's the only other reference in the Bible to a woman's hair length, how, how long a woman's hair could or should be. And the implication there is that shaving the head is, is sort of an indication that she is a captive, but it's also, it gets grown out after that, and it, it signifies that she, she's a captive, um, that she is no longer part of whatever group she used to be. Okay. Um, it's also suggested, there's a couple of other suggestions. One of them is that hair coverings were for married women. That a married woman would, would, would have a hair covering and single women would not. Okay, because uh, a woman's hair was a tremendous attraction to men. And so if you were single and wanted to attract a man, you would let your hair flow. Kind of thing. Okay, and by not having a hair covering indicated that you were single that you were available, okay? Um, another idea, and kind of getting back to, uh, it, it's been suggested that within the uh, Corinthian, the pagan culture, that the, uh, and I, I've seen only blurbs to this effect. I have not seen any actual uh, textual evidence or, or actual evidence that the um, temple prostitutes in the pagan temples would have shaved heads. And how would you know who the temple prostitutes were in Corinth? Well, they're the ones with the shaved heads. Okay. Um, again, like I said, I've, I've only seen that from, I've only seen that from, uh, I, I, I need a, a way to, to describe this kind of a source. It's like, you know, like a blurb or a, uh, a, um, a gloss, um, where it's it just it's someone says something, asserts something that supports their case, but they have no, there's no reason to believe that person. Not that he or she is lying, you know. Um, it, it's just like okay, so the pe person who said this is a is a preacher or a commentator who is not an expert on Corinthian pagan cultures, but it fits what they're trying to do. So oh well, the pagan, you know. So it's like okay, well, could be. Um, and so the assumption there, if any one of those things are true, for a woman to go into a, a service with her head uncovered, that tells everyone around that she's either single, a captive, or a prostitute. Okay, none of which are true. Okay, uh, to the Corinthian believers. Now, I like, personally, my... my to me, the best explanation is the idea that head coverings were something worn by married women. Okay? And because this ties in with something we talked about earlier, where Paul says that, that you know, one of the problems going on in the church at Corinth is that women who are married to non-believers are figuring, well, if I'm married to a non-believer, I, I don't need to continue to be married to him. And he goes through the whole, you know, if you're married to a non-believer and they want you to stay, then stay kind of thing. So, so that's a problem that they're throwing off these marriages because they're not married to believers. And one way you would throw that off is by removing your head covering and announcing to the congregation that you are not married anymore. So it ties it back into something earlier. So to me, that's the best explanation. That's what this indicated. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know that it's a, there's a cultural equivalent or anything. Um, the closest I can come up with is, is like, you know, if you, if, if everyone in, 
your in the church decided that well you know we no longer needed to be, give any indication of being married so we're not going to wear wedding rings we're not going to do um uh, uh you know like then so that's it no more no more wedding rings we're not going to wear wedding rings anymore okay um and it's like okay well are you married or not well do you have a wedding or not kind of you know, that's kind of a cultural thing in the U.S. It's not the same, you know, um, but Paul is saying, no, you, you need to maintain this indication that you're still married, okay? You need to maintain the idea that your, your head covering is going on, okay? Um, so again, it is argued that women with short hair uncovered suggest being single or worse and adulterous. Did I mention that? That's another one, that that was a punishment. Okay. I don't give you a lot of line there because, you know, if you go one more line, it crosses over into the next when you're doing the... And on Google Docs, I haven't figured out how to expand the margins yet. It's like you're just kind of stuck with the margins you're given. And this ties back to Chapter 7's uh, discussion about believers' responsibility in marriage. So to me, that's what's, that's what's going on. Um, now... Um, <coughs> he says, it is the same as having hair, for if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut her off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover her head, since he is the image and glory of God. Okay? In verses 8 and 9, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Um, based on creation, now he's referring back to women are supposed to be a help to man. Okay, so again, this is getting back into the creation story. And when the word that in, the, in Genesis where it talks about women, you know, you need a helpmate, that word, that, that the Hebrew word there is, is translated multiple times in the New Testament as ally and not help. And so the point here is, is that women were created for man based on man's need, not women's weakness. Okay? Um, and so again, the word where that, that, that's translated helpmate in, in the Old Testament to describe Eve's relationship to Adam is used, I believe, and again, I have to look this up, I believe it's used 19 times in the Old Testament to refer to God's assistance to Israel in time of trouble and things like that. Okay? Um, so he, men are supposed to, to, women are supposed to help or ally, be an ally to man. Okay? Now the, the thing, and again, I'm sorry, I did not put a line in here. Um, verse 7. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Okay, now, this is an interesting passage, okay, uh, an interesting phrase. Women, man is, is made in the image of God, but women for men. Now, there are people that have been in this church who have used this passage and others to argue that um, man is made in the image of God and women are not. Okay, there are people that have been in this church. There are people that have been in this room. There are people who have stood in this spot <laughs> where I'm standing right now who have argued to the shock and consternation of people in the room, I not mention any names, that women are not made in the image of God. Okay? I don't believe that's what Paul is getting to. I mean, I think because Genesis 1 makes it pretty clear, you know, made in the image of God, created he mankind, male and female, created he them, kind of thing, Genesis 127. Um, I don't think that's consistent with what Genesis teaches. But some have taken this and said, okay, well, yeah, man is made in the image of God. And women are, are made for the glory of man. Okay? Now, if you're a, 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 a very strong complementarian, that's a great passage. You know, it's just one more reason to, you know, point out how, you know, the husband is... And again, going, if this is, in fact, talking about husband and wife, you know, that, you know, it, it kind of... You know, if you look at this passage, when man and woman, so, okay, if that's true, if, if we literally take it exactly as the face seems to, to suggest, does that mean that every man is dominant over every woman? Or is it talking about husband and wife? 
So to me, I think he's talking more husband and wife, which is what I think Paul is getting at here. Okay, not necessarily all men and all women. women. Okay. Um, but he says, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for a woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman have, ought to have authority over her own head. Okay, so ultimately here, it's interesting, it comes down to the woman's choice whether or not she covers her head or not. So, I mean, Paul is not telling, hey, husbands, get your wives in line here. Or men, get your wives in line here. Or, you know, men, get the women in the church in line here. He's just like, it's, it's, the woman needs to have authority over her own head. It's, it's, it's your choice as far as what you do or not. Okay? Um, and I think in verses 11 and 12, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. So ultimately, men and women, husbands and wives, are fundamentally interdependent. Okay. Now the thing about let's well, let me go on. <coughs> verse twelve. For, I'm sorry. Verse thirteen. Judge for yourselves. Okay. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you? That if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. Now this is where in 11.14 we bring back the idea that it's the hair covering he's talking about, not necessarily a cap. Okay. Now here's, here's the thing about this, this passage. You can, if, if you look at this passage and you say, okay, well, no, this is clear. We need to... You know, this is this shows clearly that men are made in the image of God and women are, you know, the glory of men. They're not made in the image of God. Then I expect to see your wife with a cap hat on, or certainly I expect to see you with short hair, men, and I expect to see the women with with long hair. The trouble is the church, by and large, does not has long given up that fight. All right, um, there are churches still, uh, specifically the Mennonites. The Amish, um, some Plymouth Brethren churches, and other, and I'm sure there are others that still the women traditionally wear hats, have hair coverings. Pardon me. Or little yeah. Okay. Something, were they, were they Mennonite or uh -huh. Plymouth Brethren? Okay. Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, just a quick review for those who have forgotten this: that the Mennonites are the, the current descendants of the Anabaptists. Okay, so the Anabaptists, so you had the Reformation going on. You had, you had Martin Luther over here in Germany, and you had um, Zwingli over here in, in, in Switzerland. <coughs> the thing about the, the difference between Zwingli and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, they're, but they're simultaneous, same time it's going on. Okay, uh, the difference between Zwingli, there's several differences between Zwingli and Luther. One of them was that. Um, Zwingli died when he was 41. Luther lived to be 70, 75 or something. something like that. I don't remember how old he was. Um, but he, for the time, he lived a very long, a very long life. Um, and Luther, especially in the latter part of his life, never had an unpublished thought. Okay. So because Luther was there, his, and he had the more dramatic start with the whole 95 Theses and all of that, and here I stand, I can do no other. You know, Luther gets better press. Okay? But over here you've got Zwingli. And Zwingli, um, his, his, you know, Luther argued that if it's not in the Bible, we take it out. In terms of styles of worship or approach to worship and faith and things like that. Zwingli argued that you only put in what's in the Bible. 
Okay. So, one, and, I, and again, I've talked about this when I talked about the Reformation and all, but, but one way to describe it is if, if Luther and Zwingli were, you know, organizing their sock drawer, Luther would open up the sock drawer and say, I only want white socks in this drawer. So he would take out every non-white sock out of the drawer. Okay? Whereas Zwingli would open the drawer, drop everything out, and only put the white socks back in. Okay? Um, and so Zwingli argued that, you know, so we'd only do what the Bible explicitly says. And so, great, there's a lot of followers there. Um, and a group of them, uh, Conrad Grable, Felix Mons, George Blau Blaus, I forget the third one, Blaustock, something like that, um, went through the Bible and said, well, you know, Zwingli, um, one of the things that, is, that we do that's not in the, that you have put back into the sock drawer is infant baptism. And, uh, infant, and they said, that's not in the Bible, why do we do that? And, and uh, Zwingli's like, uh, yeah, no, we're, we're going to keep infant baptism. And so these guys were the ones that said that they needed to rebaptize uh, Anna, Bap Anna rebaptize, baptize again. That's not a name that they chose for themselves, because to an Anabaptist, or, you know, to a, somebody in that, you were not being rebaptized. You had not been baptized before. But infant baptism didn't. It was nothing. It was just, just a, you know, a religious gesture at best. I mean, it didn't have any significant meaning. Um, and so, the Anabaptists and everybody hated the Anabaptists. Everybody, I like that everybody. The Protestants hated the Anabaptists. The Catholics hated the Anabaptists. Everybody hated the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists got killed left and right. Um, and the one thing about Menno Simons was that he was the Anabaptist who lived, managed to not get killed. Like all of the three original ones were, were exiled or, or executed. Um, and then you'd get one that would be successful, and then he would get killed. And another one that would be successful. Menno Simons lived. And because of that, his followers, the Anabaptists, were called after him, followers of Menno or Mennonites. Okay, so, so they are related to Baptists in that, you know, there, there's some differences, um, but they become like the, the Mennonites, and then they split off of the Mennonites are the Amish. Okay, um, and then Plymouth Brethren, they're in there somewhere, too. Um, I don't know. I don't know where. Um, they may be out of the English Baptist. That's a whole other story. But the Mennonites now have head coverings in the church. Okay, um, but we don't. We don't do that. We don't follow that. We don't uh, at, at our church. And I'm, by our church, I mean First Baptist. We don't. We don't do that. We don't. Uh, although we, there are some of us, like uh, you know, when I went to college, um, you know, we were talking about this on the on the way up. Um, you know, there was a very strict hair code at the school I went to. That your hair had to be a cut a certain way. Um, and if it was long, pardon me? For men. For men. Um, and and to, to give an example, technically speaking, right now, this glorious do of mine would not pass. It would be too long. Um, and you, we would once every, I don't know, two, three weeks or something like that, we'd be walking in the chapel and there'd be uh, monitors at the door. That's what they, you know, the, these guys who had sold their soul to the school um, would be standing at the door. And as you walked in, you would, they would look, be looking at your hair. And you knew, you knew it was a hair check day because you'd walk in and you'd see all the monitors standing at the door. And they'd walk in and you'd get, uh, if your hair didn't meet the, qualifications or the, the you know it had to be off the collar off the ears out of the eyes they would you know, hand you this piece of paper and you would report to the dean's office so you knew that uh, when you went to to into chapel that day <coughs> one of the, one of the you know they said people with glasses had an advantage because you could you know the glasses could you know put you put your hair down behind the glasses so you know um, if you had glasses you certainly wanted to be wearing them that day um, and then uh, the, the other thing was that, that you, you always went in looking down. So you, you walked in, you know, like this. You, you, you didn't walk in like this because the hair is supposed to be off the collar. And if you're like this, it, you're advertising that your hair is on your collar. And everybody had a collar on because you had to wear a tie. So it was, you know, so you always went in looking down if you had glasses because they were very clear that men had to have short hair. Now, back then, this was in the 80s. 60s, 70s, and 80s, 
um, long hair was a real deal. It was a big, it was a huge cultural thing. Okay. Um, I don't think it was nearly as huge a cultural thing as the school made it out to be. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, I was telling Debbie, I, I didn't, I did not get caught, uh, busted very often for that. Um, because I did not go to that particular school to break the rules. Um, I was paying for it, so I was not about to, you know, flout the, uh, the authority. Um, so I tried to keep my hair, hair, hair at the right length. Uh, but they, they took it very seriously, you know. And, and I was asking, I don't believe there was a short hair rule for girls, that your hair couldn't be too short. Um, I don't know what their hair rules are now today. I have to find someone, or a niece, right? Yeah, that's, the niece says, go, yeah, I have to call my niece and find out, although she may or may not know. Um, it's not as big a deal, you know, the hair length is not as big a deal. But even still, you know, there are some churches where it is. There are some places where they, they would do that. Now, we have not, you know, we, we, you know, here at First Baptist, we do not look at somebody, a guy, and say, hey, you know, you got really long hair, so you can't, you can't be on the worship team. You can't be serving, you know, you can't be in public here. We don't want to put you anywhere in public. I mean, we had a, we had an usher here for quite a few years who had, you know, gorgeous, wavy, long hair and perfectly, you know, polished and painted fingernails. He would, and, and he was here for quite some time. I just know that because he would pass the offering plate to me. And I think, wow, those are, those are some seriously nice manicured fingernails you got there. But um, he's, not, he's not here anymore. But we don't, so we don't do that. We don't look at guys that have long hair and go, hey, you need to get a haircut. Okay. Um, by the same token, we don't come up behind. I can't, you know, now, especially I think in, in the African-American community, it's far more common to see women with very short hair, like crew cut length hair. But there's some, there's one actress, <coughs> Michelle Williams, I think is her name, who has very short hair that wouldn't look much different than, than a man's haircut. Um, you know, but we, we, don't, we don't enforce this. We don't look at this and go, oh, well, we, you know. And, and I only point that out to, to say, if you ask somebody why you do that, why, why don't we enforce that? Why don't we look at this and say, hey, men don't have to have long hair? Um, the, the typical answer you will get, and I, I'm, I'm not just wandering here for the sake of wandering, um, the typical um, response that you'll get is because, oh, well, that was culturally based, which is true, okay? Um, and that's okay, and I agree with that. I 100% agree with that, that it's not the deal it is today, that nobody, nobody looks at a man with long hair and says, well, you hippie rebel, kind of, kind of, I might, you know, but, uh, you know, there's a, there's a kid, my, my, my dad was in the Marines, so, and he always had a crew cut his whole life. So he was always very uh, persnickety about people's hair length, men's hair length in general. You know, I need a haircut, you know. It was kind of his uh, first comment about anybody, I need a haircut, you know. Um, and so my, my son was working with a guy recently, uh, my younger son was working with a guy, a great kid, um, who had very long hair. And I just got in a habit of every time I see him channeling my dad, Hey, you need a haircut. I'll cut your hair right now if you want me to. Pull out and I'll do it right now for you. I mean, this kid has really, really long hair, you know. Um, but uh, he never took me up on it. I don't, I don't know why. Um, the point is, is and, and I'm, I'm fine with that. <coughs> I'm fine with making this cultural distinction. It's like, but, you, you know, and this is going to come back big time later in the text, later in the book. And that's why I'm laying the foundation now. Um, then it's like, okay, let's, let's be consistent across the book with that. Okay, so I'm just hold that thought. Store it in the back of your mind. Hold, hold that thought here, okay? Um, it isn't a question of, well, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't interpret the Bible. Like the other day, or not, last year, 2023, last year, um, my, my big accomplishment on the deacon board was, was revising the church constitution. And what I did was I took the practices of the church and modified the constitution to meet the practices of the church. Well, that's great constitution writing. Okay, that's terrible biblical exegesis. 
okay? You just say, well, what do we do and how can we use this verse to practice what we want or how we want the world to be? We can't, you know, it's like, what is it? What is the text pointing out? And again, I think that Paul here in this passage is talking about, um, is going back to women uh, throwing off marriage. So to me, that's what this passage is about. Marriage to unbelievers. Correct. Specifically marriage to unbelievers. Yeah, possibly marriage in general. Possibly, remotely, but specifically marriage to to non-believers. I think that's what Paul is talking about. Now, there are, again, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's the annual cough. Um, there are people that, uh, you know, will take this very seriously. There are churches where people do um, uh, wear head coverings, where if the men have long hair, they will be pulled aside by the pastor and go, Psst, hey, hippie, get a haircut, kind of thing. Um, but that it doesn't, it doesn't happen here. Um, does not, and of course, verse 14, I don't know how many times I heard that verse quoted when I was in high school. And when I, when I was a kid, when I worked, I worked at a, a camp, a church camp in Tennessee for three summers. Um, and it was a routine thing that somebody would come into the camp with very long hair. And the, the guy would uh, make a decision for Christ somewhere along the week, and they would cut his hair. That he would, you know, I just remember one kid in particular came in with really long hair, long wavy hair, like down to his shoulders. And then somewhere, you know, because everybody, you know, at a camp like that, somebody with hair, even now, you know, if you see a guy with really super long hair, that kind of still, it kind of sticks out. You know, yeah, that guy's got really long hair. Um, and and we, we, we kind of make, make judgments about that, but the guy would cut his hair. Um, but it, it has. But there were believers. There were there were Christians that, you know, would would have very long hair. I mean, we, Debbie and I went to a church one time, and uh, when we were first dating, and uh, we sat behind a guy who had like a ponytail down to his waist, right? It was a ponytail down to his waist. And and I remember in all my righteous glory, sitting back there looking at this guy, thinking. Oh, this is clearly the unsaved husband. You know, just like this is, no doubt we'll be praying for this guy because he's clearly, you know. Um, but the service was over. When the service got over, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here how, how this went, but after the service was over, he and his wife turned around and invited us over to their house for ice cream or some pie. And we went over to their house, and this guy turned out to be a wonderful Christian he and his family turned out to be a wonderful Christian man, man and woman, uh, great believer, and uh, you know a dedicated witness. Um, never cut his hair. <laughs> it was, and he was an older guy too. I mean, he would have been. And it was because graying. You know, he had that whole long graying hair look. Um, but he he uh, had a hand like a handmade house. Like he had built his house by hand, like with logs and stuff, and it was really. Beautiful house, great guy. Um, had been part of the Jesus People. Remember the Jesus People, Japuza, Jesus People USA. Um, but that was his, you know. Um, and, and it was kind of a real eye opener for for me. I'm like, to, to this day, I'm still referring to the thing of sitting back there in all my righteousness, going, "Wow, this guy is really." You know, you can ask Debbie what she thought, whether she remembers it afterwards. But I was like, "Whoa, this guy is like," you know. This guy's a better believer than I am. But he can't be because he's got long hair. Oh, okay. Um, but finishing up here, um, verse 16. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. <coughs> so <laughs> if you still disagree with Paul, he's got no other suggestions. It's like, that's, he's like, hey, this is it, man. I, I, again, I don't... We have no other practice. You're on your own there if you, if you want to choose differently. But again, I think he's talking about marriage. I think he's talking about women throwing off the indications that they're married or declaring themselves single in, in, the, audit, in, in, in the publication or in the, uh, in the worship services. Okay? Um, and again, this is, this is a problem going on in the worship service themselves. 
Okay. So I think the bottom line to me is, and there, again, there are people who, who would differ, but I don't, because we don't exactly know what was going on, this is not a great proof text if, you're, if you want to say, well, clearly Paul says the women need to, to make sure they're shown as being subject to, to the, the husband. I don't think that's a good, this is a good subtext for, or, or proof text for that. Okay, um, Although people will use it that way. Um, again, he's referring to a specific situation in, in Corinth that we don't know exactly what was going on and why it mattered. Well, we know what was going on. They were praying with their heads cut and covered. Why did it matter? Okay. So, um, any questions? So, is there anything that you can see as far as just husbandly authority, even among believers in the I do not. I do not. I mean, even when he talks about... Um, you know, when he talks about the, the order, or, order of creation... Where is this? Is, is that in this place? Every man of prayer is every woman. Yeah. I don't know. For a man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Um, you know, there there is a, a an argument that's made in here that says this indicates order of creation matters. Okay, that man was created first, therefore he has authority over woman. Okay, that's the that's the argument. Uh, right, you know, or at, le- or at least call it into question. The other thing, and they talk about, oh, well, you know, birth order was important in the Old Testament, and it was. You know, they said, you know, the firstborn gets such a, you know, had double, and you, you know, we've all heard these in, in light of, but if you really start thinking about that, think about all the times in the Old Testament that the whole birth order thing is up, upset. Okay, where was David in the birth order? Last. Last. Okay. Judah. Okay. The, the tribe of Judah, was Judah the oldest son? No. Was he the second oldest son? No. Was he the third oldest son? No. He was fourth. Okay, so I was like, well, wait a minute. All right, fine. You don't want to give it to Reuben. You don't want the Messiah to come through the line of Reuben. What about Issachar? No, nope, not Issachar. I forget what the other, Simeon? I think it's Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, then, then uh, Judah. Let's go with Judah. And even Judah had his issues, but they found, left it with Judah. Okay. Someday we'll talk about Judah and, and some of his, his uh, more exciting moments. I think he's a... I, well, it's, it's not. It's the very nature of things. It says the way they translate. Doth not. I mean, the King James was like, "Doth not nature itself teach you?" Um, and I think Paul is is referring here. And I know uh, Gordon Fee, I believe, argued that he's just talk, he, He's appealing to the popular consensus, you know. And it's like even earlier. And he's done this earlier. Where he talks about that that a man is sleeping with his father's wife. Not even the pagans do that. So sometimes he appeals to the popular consensus. It's like you guys are just you guys are flouting your freedom in a way that is detracting to the gospel. And I think um, so. I think he's just appealing to the popular consensus there. Um, but the problem is, is you know, women. Uh, you know, I think that's you know, on my test, the correct answer is it has to do with women. Throwing off marriage to non-believers is what he's talking about. Like, to me, I think that is the cleanest explanation. And if you if you use that to support anything else, you are going beyond the text. You wouldn't be the first person to do that, uh, and you probably wouldn't be the last. But if you do, don't blame me. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you next week. Again, what he talked about. Analogy of straightness 